Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Um, so like Doug said, my name is Colton Jones, and I just want to share my story with you all. Um, so from a very early age, I was bullied. Um, and over time, this left me with an incredibly low sense of self-worth. So I saw college as this new beginning, you know, an opportunity to be a new me. So I did college correctly, in my opinion. Uh, I worked hard, and I partied a thousand times hardy, harder. <laughs> and um, I was generally well-liked. You know, I had a lot of friends. Um, I had many accomplishments. But I remember looking at myself in the mirror one day and seeing that I wasn't happy. You know, I saw that all these accomplishments and all these friends were just superficial means of filling a void of emptiness inside of me. Essentially, I wasn't very conscious of my being and its needs. So throughout this talk, when I bring up consciousness, I mean the awareness that we have of ourselves, both internally and externally, as well as our understanding that we ourselves are deeply connected to everything and everyone else on this planet. Now, in reality, my life was filled with traumatic experiences, ones that I had repressed for many, many years. Why? Because it was much easier to ignore the pain than to deal with it. Also, it didn't help that society paints this hyper-masculine picture of black males, so my emotions were never validated in the first place. In fact, I was subconsciously taught that to feel was to be weak. So there was this inner disharmony between the, the inner CJ that I know was my true self and what I was giving off to the world. And I think that this inner disharmony speaks volumes to a larger interpersonal and societal disharmony that is present today. Now, there's this, there's this Native American proverb that reads something like this. It is only when the last tree is cut down, the last river poisoned, and the last fish caught, will man realize that he cannot eat money. Now, I want to dive a little bit deeper into this. But before I do so, I want to remind you all that things get brighter. But in order to truly contextualize where we are today, we need to get dark for a little bit. So recently, we just passed the 400 parts per million of atmospheric carbon dioxide. 50 parts per million above what was considered the safe zone. The FAO recently revealed that about half of the world's tropical rainforest, which roughly correlates to about 36 football fields worth of trees a minute, have been cleared due to deforestation and development. 56 billion animals are raised and killed for human consumption alone. And in the United States, we have 133 billion pounds of food waste each year. So I think it's safe to say that there's a disharmony among us, and it's just manifesting itself in different ways. I think at the heart of this disharmony is one of the biggest illusions of our time, and that is the illusion of separation. This idea that we are separate from each other and the things around us, including Mother Nature. Now at the forefront of this disharmony is fear. For it is only when we fear that we can justify our actions and lack thereof. So in cases of Islamophobia, like we saw in the senseless murders in Chapel Hill this past year, or the countless cases of police brutality in the United States, or the Holocaust, or slavery, are just a few examples of what happened when we separate, when we polarize people. So, this is what, so at the fundamental level of human existence, we all want to be loved. We all want to feel accepted and feel secure. You know, these things really can't be argued by anyone who has the capacity to feel human emotion. You know, these emotions are what give life its joy and majestic accent, that which fuels the heart and fuels the soul, which gives life all of its beauty. Historically, it was taught to us that species must compete with one another to survive, you know, survival of the fittest. However, science is just now catching up and realizing that species would much rather coexist with one another than compete. However, in fact, actually, competition is only necessary when resources are scarce. However, there, is far, there are more than enough resources on this planet to clothe, shelter, heal, and teach, and feed everyone on this planet. However, we in these developed nations aren't sharing with our brothers and sisters across the globe. I mean, we can even see this in our backyards, where we at Lower Marion School District have the 
privilege of being able to take home personal laptops, while people just across the street in the Philadelphia School District are using outdated textbooks, most of which they aren't able to take home. Which is why we're still here, which is why I believe we're still stuck. Because the only constant in this universe is change, and so many of us are, resistant, are resisting this change. And of this change and of this resistance, we are resisting one of the hardest conversations we can have with ourselves. And that is when we address our privileges. Now, our privileges can come from our race, our socioeconomic status, our education, or many other things. But with these privileges comes a heightened risk of apathy and complacency. I myself have, fought, have fallen victim to this. You know, many social issues were off of my radar simply because they weren't my personal experience. And this is an, an unfortunate cycle that many of us get caught up in. However, Martin Luther King reminds us that at a certain time, our silence becomes violence and essentially consent for the oppressors to keep oppressing. Um, and for those of us who wish to remain neutral in these times, we are part of the problem and keeping these cycles of systemic injustices going. However, I know that a brighter future is not only a possibility, but can become a reality. Now, of course, these, this claim has been met with dissenting arguments. You know, People have said, these problems are far too big. They've existed for such a long time, and they won't be changed. Or, I was once an activist. You'll grow out of it. Or my personal favorite, the problems don't exist at all. However, these claims are, and attitudes are ones of depleted hope ones of defeat. However, my heart refuses to be defeated. At the forefront of any change has been activism and resistance. Just look at the 60s. Just look at the civil rights movement and the anti-Vietnam War protests of the 60s. Or look at the anti-apartheid movement in the 80s, and many others just in this country alone. This is why I believe that right now we are in the midst of a mass awakening one that, if done collectively, can lead to big change. So last year, myself, I mean, not last year, last September, uh, myself and 400,000 people from all walks of life came together in New York City to protest government inaction on climate change. Soon after that, Van Jones came to Syracuse University to talk about climate justice and its inherent connection to social issues of our time. For example, he talked about how people of color literally breathe different air than wealthy people, air usually filled with toxins and pollutants that are generally kept out of wealthy and suburban neighborhoods. This was my first time seeing our problems as interconnected, as not isolated from one another, but part of a larger societal issue and part of our collective consciousness. So back to campus. There were a lot of protests and rallies going on in Syracuse's campus. And myself and other campus leaders decided to bring our individual energies together and form a collective, a larger energy, a larger body. This group would be called the General Body, a leaderless group of activists that came together to protest the system as a whole, which was leaning towards a more corporate model. What was so beautiful about the General Body was their ability to see our problems as interconnected and not isolated from one another. So one group's struggles was not superior to another. We were all there in solidarity with one another. So some of the things we were fighting for on campus were the lack of an ADA coordinator, or the prompt and non-transparent closure of the Advocacy Center, which was a place that victims of sexual assault and relationship violence could have a community uh, around them to consult them and, and give them strength. We were protesting our university's refusal to divest from the fossil fuel industry despite an overwhelming majority um, that voted in favor of divestment, as well as many other things. So my role in the general body was, one, to plan our, our action, which would be a, diverse, a diversity and transparency rally. This action would lead to what was an 18-day sit-in in our administration building. Now, my other role in the general body, and one that I took very seriously, was the vibes watcher. So essentially, I would make sure that everyone was in good spirits and that everyone felt comfortable, safe, and secure. So I developed what was called human time. 
And essentially, it was a time for us to drop everything that we were doing, gather around in a circle, and check in with ourselves in this space. During this time, we would share our stories, our traumas, our reasons for being there, and so on. And what are we all but a collection of stories and individual experiences, all holding a certain weight that can be used to teach and heal people? So through these stories, though I didn't know it at the time, we were healing each other. We were removing ourselves of this illusion of separation because we were standing there in solidarity with one another, not only listening to one another, but helping guide each other through the healing process. What I thought would be a time to share story, to share poems and songs quickly became the most healing and transformative part of the general body. So remember when I said that uh, my life was filled with traumatic experiences? I used to pride myself on being able to repress old um, experiences and not deal with the pain. However, as I heard stories of people who were in the space, I started to make the connections to my own life. So I originally went to the general body to protest divestment and protest a more sustainable campus. However, as I started to hear those stories, I started to, to make the connections to my life. I started to remember my sexual assault as a child and how deeply it scarred my being. I also remembered the immense amount of trauma that my sister went through as she was coming into her queerness. And as school and a society that was not very embracive of it. And lastly, I remembered how my little baby sister and her two su failed suicide attempts, that if nothing else, were a cry for help. In reality, all of these things were connected to me. I didn't know it at the time, but they were all root deeply rooted in a larger societal issues and problems and issues that are prevalent in our society. Now, um, so human time ended up being the most healing time of the general body. And it got to the point that even if we didn't receive concessions from the administration, we would all be leaving that space empowered and hopeful for what could be in this world. However, after 18 days, 18 long days and sleeping on brick floors, hours and hours of meetings with administrators, sleepless nights, and a lack of a good diet, we left the space with the promise that we would return if things didn't change. And they did, for the most part. So a few of the concessions we received was the university started to look for an ADA coordinator for our campus. They also raised the TA pay, which was previously below a living wage. Um, our university became the largest institution and endowment to commit to divestment from direct investment in, fossil fuel, in the fossil fuel industry. And we also received a bunch of other concessions. Now, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, but these things show us that resistance works, activism works. Now, I see what has happened in Syracuse as a microcosm for what can be in this country if certain things are reinforced. Like, imagine what seven billion people can do if we all loved and cared for one another. Now, I know it sounds idealistic, right? But I'm a dreamer, and I refuse to be confined by old ways of thinking and being. Now, we all have steps that we need to take in order to get to a place that I know is possible. Um, so the first step we need to take is we need to acknowledge, we need to rid ourselves of our egos and the many layers that it gives us. We need to acknowledge our privileges and not only do that, but realize how they shape our realities. In order to combat this, we must listen to the stories of our brothers and sisters, especially the ones who are still being oppressed in our society and in the world. Second, we must realize that evolution of consciousness is not a passive process, but one that, must be, uh, that requires actively engaging in the hard and oftentimes uncomfortable conversations. Now, I know that being uncomfortable is, uh, we are sort of hesitant to be uncomfortable, but I've seen the immense amount of growth that comes from stepping outside of our comfort zone. Third, we must realize that we are never walking this journey alone. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a beauty in solitude and being alone. However, I've seen the potential for collectivism to act as a catalyst for healing and growth. And lastly, and most importantly, we must validate ourselves and empower ourselves. And most importantly, 
we must understand that we are all worthy of all the beauty that this life has to offer. So we must not dismiss our stories or our emotions, no matter how silly or dark they are, because we are not only beings of light. And what is love without having an emotion like hate to compare it to? Um, so there are way too many injustices around us, way too much inequality around us for us to remain silent for any longer. Einstein reminds us that the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them and do nothing. It must not be forgotten that we are living in the reality created for us by our ancestors and all those who lived before us. For that reason, there should be no limitations or parameters to what we can do and build as a community, not only for ourselves, but for the future. So here's the thing. There is no, everyone's journey is different, right? And there's no one way or path to higher levels of consciousness. I'm only here to share my story and tell you all that you are all capable of helping to shape our future, okay? However, this requires for us all to actively engage in doing so. Um, we need to, so I challenge you all to love each other, to practice forgiveness, not only of others, but of ourselves, to step outside of our comfort zones as much as possible, to talk to strangers, but most importantly, to stand in solidarity with the folks who are still fighting against oppressive systems. So in New York City at the Millions March, when we took over the Brooklyn Bridge, there was a banner across, our, across the front lines that read, when we breathe, we breathe together. So as a people, as a collective species, if one of us is stuck, we're all still stuck. So there's this beautiful quote by Ram Dass, and it reads, we're all just walking each other home. So if no one, if none of you in this crowd have heard it before, I want to tell you that I love you from the bottom of my heart. And that feeling in our hearts that we get, the one that I feel right now, it lets us know that love exists, and it's a powerful feeling. It should never be underestimated. The power of the people and community should never be underestimated. Individually, our cries are just a bunch of noise. But collectively, we sing songs of harmony, of joy, and of change. I challenge you all to take this feeling that you feel right now and share it with the world. Be the change, brothers and sisters. <laughs>